Hi, I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log for Wednesday, October 7. Thinking about my days as a kid, I was about, oh, let's see, 12 maybe? I was in the youth choir at St. Peter's Catholic Church in East Troy, Wisconsin. And uh, it was back in the day of guitar masses. And nothing was more fun in this world than going to choir practice on Wednesday nights and singing up in the choir loft on Sundays. <laughs> that, that, uh, that choir kept me in church for a lot longer than I otherwise would have stayed. I became an atheist about that time, 12, 13. <laughs> when, I, when I heard James Taylor sing, let's see, how did that go? Um, there's a song that they sing when they take to the highway, a song that they sing when they take to the sea, a song that they sing of their home in the sky. Maybe you can believe it if it helps you to sleep, but singing works just fine for me. Yeah, a song that they sing of their home in the sky. Maybe you can believe it if it helps you to sleep, but singing works just fine for me. Yeah, I was a 12-year-old kid thinking, you know, this whole God thing just isn't making any sense to me at all. But I couldn't quite entertain the notion that I was an atheist. And then I heard James Taylor sing that lyric. And I thought, yeah, you know, maybe it is okay to be an atheist. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great lyric. That's from uh, Sweet Baby James, which was written for his nephew on the occasion of his birth. He was on his way to visit his newborn nephew named James. And uh, so that's where we get the references to, um, uh, especially that second verse there. The first of December was covered with snow. So was the turnpike from Stockbridge to Boston. Though the Berkshires seem dreamlike on account of that frosting, with ten miles behind me and ten thousand more to go. So yeah, he's uh, he's alluding there to his trip, his uh, car trip out to see his nephew. Sweet baby James. Anyway, I was thinking about those days with sweet fondness because Johnny Nash passed away at the age of 80 years old. And, of course, he was the singer-songwriter responsible for I can see clearly now the rain is gone. One of the most wonderful songs ever put out on a radio wave. I can see all obstacles in my way. Oh, try not to smile singing that song. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's going to be a bright bright sunshiny day that was the first song that we sang as a group the, a few of the kids in my youth church choir decided to form our own little group and perform in talent shows around in the area I for, we called it we was some real corny name the sunshine singers or something like that this was the days of the cow sills and the partridge family <laughs> you know and so we, we chose happy, sweet songs to sing. And uh, that was one of the first songs I sang in public, you know, with a, with a band and a, a microphone in my hand. <laughs> Johnny Nash, get out of here. What a great guy. You might not know this. He was uh, responsible for bringing us Bob Marley. Johnny Nash was not just a singer, a songwriter, but also a producer and he loved reggae, and he started his own record company with his partner Danny Sims while living in Jamaica, where they signed Bob Marley and the Whalers. So, um, there you go. Johnny Nash. I can see clearly now, hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100, November 4th, 1972. Stayed in the top spot for four weeks. And, of course, many of us know the 1993 version by Jimmy Cliff. I think I can see clearly now. We, we should all make sure that's downloaded. 
Make sure that's in our queue, ready to go. I think, uh, I think that song will be very appropriate for November 4th <laughs> or 5th or 6th or 7th, whenever this thing gets settled. Who knows when it's exactly going to be. But have that song ready to go. I think that'll be a very, very nice little anthem for election results. Don't you? That, of course, and uh, Martha and the Vandellas, right? Everyone around the world, are you ready for a brand new beat? Yeah, dancing in the street. We got to have that one queued up. We could almost play that one today. I thought, you know, I was thinking of that song just last night, too, when I heard the news about Stephen Miller. <laughs> what other songs? We're going to have to start building our uh, playlist. Our post-election playlist. All right? You start thinking about what ought to be on that playlist. Let's, uh, let's start building that. Dancing in the Street, Martha and the Vandellas. And I Can See Clearly Now by Johnny Nash. For sure. Those are the top two right now. We'll, we'll keep adding to that list. <laughs> uh, gotta, gotta find ways to celebrate and be happy when the news every day is, uh, you know, things like this. Uh, September was the world's hottest on record. From Reuters, last month was the world's hottest September on record with unusually high temperatures recorded off Siberia, in the Middle East, and in parts of South America and Australia. The European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service said on Wednesday. And we just had that record heat in Death Valley. Uh, was that just the month before in August, right? Extending a long-term warning trend caused by emissions of heat-trapping gases High temperatures this year have played a major role in disasters from fires in California and the Arctic to floods in Asia, scientists say. Yeah, <clears throat> great massive ice sheets are falling away. So good luck to us all. Another reason we'll all be seeing a little more clearly on uh, November 4th, 5th, or 10th, or whatever it is, if we can... Uh, turn some of our attention back toward this, the greatest problem facing us. Looking at some doom and gloom headlines <laughs> this morning. Here's another one. You know what? I'm going to share this one on the Facebook page. This is what hunger looks like in COVID-19 America. NBCnews.com had a pretty good piece. An analysis from Feeding America projected that food insecurity will hit 52 million people due to COVID-19, which is an increase of 17 million people from pre-pandemic times. Between March and June, it is estimated that 4 in 10 visitors to food banks are in need due to COVID-19-related reasons such as school shutdowns or job loss. Yeah, and I just saw the headline last night. One-third of children are food insecure. One-third of American children are food insecure. And go back to this little piece I read. 17 million people before the pandemic, when supposedly we had this raging economy, right? Don't let anyone ever tell you about that. Don't, don't let them fool you on that one at all. There were troubles before this pandemic, Great gaps in wealth and income, low subsistence, poverty wages, food insecurity. Yeah, our bright, sunshiny day can't come quick enough here. And, and food banks aren't going to cut it. I mean, God bless them and all the people volunteering. We have a great food bank right here in my neighborhood, the River West Food Bank here in River West, the greatest neighborhood in the world. But it's not a solution. It's not a long-term solution. It's not a permanent solution. It's not a comprehensive solution. These are medics on a battlefield, basically, saving people's lives. But food banks is not a comprehensive permanent plan any more than medics on a battlefield are a comprehensive permanent health care plan. So with all the daily drama, and, and there's plenty of it, 
to keep us outraged and entertained. Just a couple of reminders here today. The planet's on fire and people are starving. We need to keep our eyes on the prize here. And while all of this continues, many of us continue to be hoodwinked and distracted. I don't know what the stock market did yesterday. It goes up, it goes down, but mostly it soars. And the orange menace will try to tell you that, oh, all of America benefits. That's your 401ks. And with any good lie, there's that little tiny nugget of truth in there. Yeah, if you have a 401k, you're going to benefit from a rising stock market. But that doesn't change the fact that 1%, 1% of Americans own 50% of the value of stocks held by individual households. Yeah, and the orange menace is always saying how great it is. Oh, everybody. No, your little 401k, yeah, you're going to get a couple bucks. But the higher your bracket, the more you're making. And the great majority of gains are going to the top 1%. And not only that, the top white 1%. And not only that, the top white male 1%. So don't let anybody tell you that the stock market is a barometer of economic health. And then if you take it a step further, which I, I need to keep reminding you, what this show is about is about the elimination of money itself. Because just at its core, by its very definition, it's anathema to a just society. Any money you make from your stock rising, whether middle class or rich, is wealth created by somebody laboring. That's how it works. The whole idea of your make your money work for you, your money isn't working for you. Some schlub on a factory line is working for you. Marx and Engels had it exactly right when they pointed out the obvious that wealth is only created by labor. So the working person creates the wealth but doesn't see that in their paycheck. No, <laughs> that extra wealth created, well, a little bit, a, a couple cents goes to you in your little 401k and millions of dollars go to the 1%. Millions and billions of dollars. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be an economist like I know every in and out of all of this, but that's the basic formula, and nobody can deny it. Go find the Ph.D. economist in your neighborhood and ask them if that's not the case. I'm, I'm not stretching anything here. It's just the fact. Labor creates wealth. And if you think your money is working for you, no. Somebody else's sweat and toil is working for you. And you're taking it. So, yeah, I've had about enough of the, uh, the stock market talk. That can all just go away. I mean, that's what I'm going to pull out my playlist. That's what I'm going to be dancing in the street. When the money and profit system is crushed under the boot of history. That's when I'll be dancing in the street. Well, back to uh, today's headlines. Hey, we mentioned Stephen Miller yesterday because when I recorded yesterday's show, we hadn't yet heard that Stephen Miller <laughs> tested positive for the virus. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. We heard that later in the day. But the night before, as I told you yesterday, I kept seeing headlines Stephen Miller tests positive, Stephen Miller tests positive from social media friends. And nobody had a link. And then I scolded you guys for sharing news without a link. Because every time I saw the news two nights ago that Stephen Miller tested positive, I would check again. I would search his name. Nobody, nobody, nobody was reporting it. And then 24 hours later, boom, there it is verified everybody's reporting it it's it's true so <laughs> there's kind of a weird deal uh <laughs> get my day straight here today's wednesday right okay so tuesday night it's verified monday night it was all over the all over the social feed without any verification so my question is i wonder where <laughs> i wonder where all of these people were getting the news or they're just clairvoyant all of them i don't know what the deal is on that just another reminder Please, 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 for the love of God, please, when you share news on social media, give me a link, would you? 
Give me a reliable source that I can look up and verify. Would you please? <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Oh, man. All right. So we know the news by now. Uh, the Orange Menace has pulled the plug on the coronavirus stimulus talks. Didn't tell anybody. Just did it on his own. In his own, he's jacked up on steroids, so he's just a true monster now. He just decided to tweet it. Nope. All right. I hereby instruct my team to uh, stop it. We'll do this after the election, after I win. So basically, uh, it, was a little, it was a little tweet of extortion. Ah, it's a nice little economy you got here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. So he's threatening dire economic collapse unless we reelect him. <laughs> yeah, reelect me, then I'll think about it. He really is. He really has become a mad villain now. This, I mean, it's real. He's raging on these steroids. It's like he's got this. Uh, he he he's a comic villain. In, in a very real sense. You know, the origin story about how they have some sort of chemical accident or something. Well, he's been injected now. I can't wait to see the movie on this. I've been saying for a long, long time, where's the movie? Where's the biopic on this guy? There's just way too much drama and intrigue and skullduggery. I mean, what a story. Where's the movie I've been saying all these years? But I can see now that it's going to have to be more than a movie. It's going to have to be a whole full 24-episode series. Maybe three or four full seasons of 20, 24 series. I mean, come on. <laughs> Man. Yeah, we have a real-life mad villain in the White House. And, and, and here's another almost daily reminder. Now, we know he's not going to resign, but... I think each one of us really should say it out loud every day, at least once, demanding his resignation or demanding the people around him give him the boot, invoke the 25th Amendment. He's a clear and, He was a clear and present danger before he went to Walter Reed. Now he's come out this supervillain, and he's a clear and present danger exponentiated beyond description. I mean, he was already... He was already lethal, and now he's super villain lethal. So every one of us, I think, has the obligation to cry out loud every single day. Resign. Boot the guy. He's dangerous. He's an imminent threat. And none of this is exaggeration. This is... <laughs> we never got around to talking about this, but you heard about this study, right? Again, before he went in, this was from uh, a few days before that, Cornell University researchers analyzing 38 million English language articles. See, this is what these big universities can do. It's amazing. Okay. Uh, analyzed 38 million English language articles about the pandemic. They found that President was the single largest driver of what they call the infodemic. Mentions of Mr. R made up nearly 38% of the overall misinformation conversation, making the president the largest driver of falsehoods involving the pandemic. The study, which was released last Thursday, is the first comprehensive examination of coronavirus misinformation in traditional and online media. The biggest surprise was that the president of the United States was the single largest driver of misinformation around COVID, said Sarah Evanega, the director of the Cornell Alliance for Science and the study's lead author. That's concerning in that there are real-world dire health implications. Reading there from the New York Times. Yeah, and that was before. That was before he got his superpowers. And now he's jacked up on steroids. Side effects, delusions of grandeur, which he already had. Side effects, psychosis, which he already had. And we've seen the results. Ripping off the mask, bragging about what a great leader he is for taking on the virus. As though he walked out onto a battlefield to fight it with a sword and shield. 
It's it's sheer lunacy. Well, while we have time here, I really need to talk about the other side of the equation because uh, I went back and listened to this at the uh, insistence of many friends who said, you got to hear the Biden speech from Tuesday. You have to hear the Biden speech. He gave a speech in, uh, at uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and I did listen to it, and it was kind of amazing. And what made me happy about it, well, a couple of things. He delivered it well. He's capable of delivering a speech. That's kind of big on the job description for president. You have to be able to deliver a speech well, and he can do that. Okay, that's good. Also, somebody wrote this thing. <laughs> I'm quite sure he didn't write it. But somebody did, somebody on his team, and it's a hell of a speech. Uh, let me see. Have I got time to let's play a little bit. Let's play a little bit of that speech from Joe Biden Gettysburg yesterday. Uh, again, the, I recommend you, you hear the whole thing. You really should. It, it's pretty amazing. But this is just one little part I want to play for you. Too many Americans see our public life not as an arena for mediation of our differences but rather they see it as an occasion for total, unrelenting partisan warfare. Instead of treating each other's party as the opposition, we treat them as the enemy. This must end. We need to revive the spirit of bipartisanship in this country, a spirit of being able to work with one another. When I say that, and I've been saying it for two years, now I'm accused of being naive. I'm told maybe that that's the way things used to work, Joe, but they can't work that way anymore. Well, I'm here to tell you they can and they must if we're going to get anything done. I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I will govern as an American president. I'll work with Democrats and Republicans. I'll work as hard for those who don't support me as those who do. That's the job of a president, the duty to care for everyone. The refusal of Democrats and Republicans to cooperate with one another is not due to some mysterious force beyond our control. It's a decision. It's a choice we make. And if we can decide not to cooperate, we can decide to cooperate as well. That's the choice I'll make as president. But there's something bigger going on in this nation than just our broken politics. Something darker, something more dangerous. And I'm not talking about ordinary differences of opinion. Competing view to, viewpoints give life and vibrancy to our democracy. No, I'm talking about something different, something deeper. Too many Americans seek not to overcome our divisions, but to deepen them. We must seek not to build walls, but bridges. We must seek not to have our fists clenched, but our arms open. We have to seek not to tear each other apart, but seek to come together. You don't have to agree with me on everything, or even on most things. To see that we're experiencing today is neither good nor normal. I made the decision to run for president after Charlottesville. Close your eyes and remember what you saw. Neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and the KKK coming out of the fields with torches lighted, veins bulging, chanting the same anti-Semitic bile heard across Europe in the 30s. It was hate on the march, in the open, in America. Hate never goes away. It only hides. And when it's given oxygen, when it's given an opportunity to spread, when it's treated as normal and acceptable behavior, we've opened a door in this country that we must move quickly to close. As president, that's just what I will do. I will send a clear, unequivocal message to the entire nation. There is no place for hate in America. 
I'll be given — it will be given no license. It will be given no oxygen. It will be given no safe harbor. I'm going to recommend that you, that you see it. You go back and, and watch it. All right, so this is, a, this is a central theme for him. And it's the one thing I think he still doesn't quite get. He talks about how the two sides have to come together in the first half of that little clip there, right? And of course, when I'm hearing that, you know what I'm thinking. No, I'm not going to come together. Is this what you would have said in 1930s Germany? Well, we, the parties just have to come together. We have to compromise. No, you have to defeat. You have to destroy the radicals on the other side. And he doesn't s still seem to get that the Republican Party has gone off the cliff. The leadership of the party is 100% corrupt. And everybody else in the party, well, they are appeasing the extremists. So, <laughs> no. But then in the second half of that clip, he does mention Charlottesville and the neo-Nazis and says that they have to go. So at least he's saying that much. That's good. Oh, the other infuriating thing about that clip. He says, I'll work for Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> Joe, do you know how that sounds to a lot of us? We got all kinds of music here. Country and Western. This corporate party duopoly is going to have to end at some point if we're going to make any progress at all as a nation. And the fact that he can even frame it that way. I'll be the president of Democrats and Republicans. No, you'll be the president of all Americans. Democrats, Republicans, independents, socialists, libertarians. To say I'll be the president of Democrats and Republicans is saying I sing country and Western. Got to get over that, man. Got to get over that. Anyway. All right. So tonight we'll all sit back and watch the vice presidential debate. And, uh, of course, they had to negotiate the Democrats, Republicans, the uh, Commission for Presidential Debates. They all had to negotiate this plexiglass. It was the plexiglass wars. And I guess the Pence team has finally agreed to allow plexiglass. Oh, isn't that great for you? The last I read, Kamala Harris is going to have a big old plexiglass next to her. And the moderator is going to have a big old plexiglass in front of them. But Bobblehead Mike said, no, no, thanks. And he's the one he's the one endangering everybody. At last count, I, I counted up to 24. I'm sure there's more by now. 24 people have tested positive just in the last couple of days. And Mike Pence has been swimming in that pool consistently. So he's the one we're worried about. This is they really ought to be doing this by Zoom. And if the Orange Menace is still standing next week at this time, and if they have that debate, that's got to be a Zoom. Come on, a zoom, a zoom, a zoom, a zoom. All right. All right. So uh, let's watch that. We'll talk about that tomorrow and other things. I love you. This is The Log. Find it on any of your more popular podcast platforms. Or go to charlesbursell.com. There's the website right there. And every episode is always there. And all the other podcasts we've done over the years. There are lots of different titles, lots of different shows. It's a lot of fun. So uh, check out the podcast page at charlesbursell.com. All right, there you go. See ya.